we're in a series now called Once Upon a Land, and this is um, a, a series where we're kind of having fun with the idea of fairy tales, and the, a fairy tale and a Bible story, we can call it stories, but really there it's an event. The Bible is built on events, but sometimes we can refer to them as, as Bible stories, but the two of those things actually are a whole lot closer than we think that they would be. So we would think that you know, a fairy tale and something we read in the Bible would be really, really far apart. But actually, they're quite similar. And they've got three things that they share in common. So a fairy tale, every fairy tale is going to have these three things. And then we'll see that the Bible has the same. So fairy tales all start with, hey, once upon a time. That's how those start. And they usually end with, and they lived happily ever after. Um, but they have interesting characters. So I, I don't know why I can't get Shrek out of my mind, but Shrek is the character that I think about when I think about fairy tales. Very interesting character. Beauty and the Beast. I identify with the Beast there. They all have supernatural events. So these are like supernatural things that are happening. Uh, you know, you prick your finger. Who was it? It was a Cinderella pricked your finger and then fell asleep and then had to be awoken with a kiss. You know, that's a pretty supernatural event. Uh, some of you single people would think getting kissed is pretty supernatural for your lives. <laughs> I just had to piggyback onto what Kyle said. Uh, and then the third thing is important life lessons. Uh, fairy tales always have some kind of very important life lesson that comes with them, and Bible stories are the same way. In fact, a Bible story shares those exact three things. In a Bible story, We'll have interesting characters. An interesting character would be like Peter, who walked on water. It would be Jesus, who raised Lazarus from the dead. It would be Moses, who led the Israelites through the desert. It, it could be any of those characters. We also have supernatural events. These are things that shouldn't happen, but they do happen. A again, Peter walking on water, that's absolutely supernatural. The idea of feeding 5,000 out of two loaves and a couple different fish, and Jesus multiplying that. It's a very supernatural event. And then life lessons. I mean, come on, we can't argue with the fact that the Bible is just full of life lessons in it. Good life lessons, by the way. So if you think about it, if fairy tales contain the same three elements that a Bible story contains in it, then what's the difference between those two? And this is where we find a tension point with some people. Because some people don't feel like there is a difference between the two. They feel like that Jonah and the well, or they feel like the parting of the Red Sea, or Jesus resurrecting from the dead, all of those are just like a fairy tale. It's not real. It's not a real story. But the thing that differentiates those two things, and this is what makes it hard to argue against a lot of what's in the Bible. You can argue against some stuff, sure. But what makes it really hard to argue against it is the fact that there are real locations that back up the events that we talk about in the Bible. In fact, just to put it simply for you, real things happen in real places. So when we read through the Bible, we can take those events, those locations, and things that it talks about in the geography, in the landscape, in the culture, and we can point to this is a real thing. So to put this in terms that everyone can understand, not only does the Bible prove itself through geography, through culture, through location, through writing, but sources outside the Bible also confirm and prove what is written about in the Bible. And location is one of those things. Last week we talked about this town called Capernaum and how that real location the, the, was the, the, the home of Jesus. That's what he called you know, his home and where a lot of his ministry happened about, out of that place. And today we're talking about a place called the, the Temple Mount. Now, the Temple Mount. This is a real location. You'll find this in your Bible. We're going to read the scripture on it here in just a minute. This is a real thing. It's a real place. When you hear in the New Testament, Jesus talking about going to the temple in Jerusalem, it's at this place. It, we know where it is. Archaeologists have dug it up. It's been dated. It's been tested. It's been fact-checked against outside writings. That We're no longer in a place where we're trying to figure out, is this really a real place and did this really was this really the place that Jesus was talking about here in this in this Bible story in this context the answer to that is yes so I'm gonna show you where it is because if location matters here we have we looked at a map like this last week we've got Africa over here we've got Egypt and the the Nile River the Mediterranean Sea you've got the desert you've got up here you've got Asia and you've got Europe up here on this side and this wonderful strip right here in the middle where Jerusalem is, 
that's such a significant part of the world. Back then, it was the ancient world. So this is kind of the known world. Uh, it's where the Roman Empire was. It's where people wanted to conquer. I mean, the Israelites, when they left Egypt, they went this way towards the land, uh, towards the promised land, to retake that land there. So th this, is, this whole section here is super, super important. It's still important today. You know, the, the city of Jerusalem today is split into four sections. There's a Muslim section, a Christian section, a Jewish section, and then an Armenian section. That's one city split in four ways because people are still uh, arguing and fighting for the significance of this area and this land. In fact, we can zoom in here on Jerusalem and see just how important it is. Jerusalem, now today, this big sprawling kind of city, but Back then, in Jesus' time, so we're going to talk about maybe 30 A.D. as far as the date is concerned, you just had what we would call the old city of Jerusalem. And you probably can't see it here, but there's a tiny little red circle around it. But it's a, a tiny area that now makes up a small part of today what is considered kind of big Jerusalem. Now, I've got a view of, of the old city here that they'll show you. Inside the old city... This is the old city here, and you've got a wall that goes around it. And this highly, highly significant area that sits on top of this here, this is what's called the Temple Mount. It's called the Temple Mount, not because it is the temple, but because it is the place that the temple was built on top of. See, Jerusalem is up on a hill, or they would call it a mountain. And in order to build something on top of something that's not flat, you have to make something that's flat in order to build on top of it. And so therefore, they built and they made the Temple Mount. Now, when you hear other things in the Bible, just again, let me prove this location to us. The Bible talks about the Kidron Valley, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. This is where Jesus went to and where he prayed and where things happened. And, and that, that's, right, that's right here, just off the side of the temple. And then when they talk about Jesus walking up into the Mount of Olives... The Mount of Olives is right through the, the Kidron Valley, and it's, and it's up here in this corner up there. You know, it's all right there. In fact, next to the Mount of Olives is this, this area that doesn't look wonderful and beautiful because it's a cemetery. Because people felt like, the Jewish people feel that one day the Savior will return. And when He returns, He'll return to the Mount of Olives. And so they want to be first in line. So they're quite literally in line in their graves because they think that you'll be resurrected from the top of the hill down. So that, that's, that makes up that area there. So what we read in the Bible, the way it talks about geography, it's all here. It's all right here. Now, what you see on top of this, this big, beautiful kind of metal copper dome there, is called the Dome on the Rock. Now, it's not a mosque. It's not a church, but it is a shrine. And just off to the side of that, there is a, there is a mosque that's up there. Now, to me, when I was doing this research, I thought, man, that's just so wild to think that Solomon built this temple so that it would be a, a place of worship and prayer and sacrifice to God, but sitting on top of it is not the temple. Instead, there's a shrine and a mosque. And in fact, if you look here, this wall is called the, the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. And this is where people, they go to and they pray. And you can go back one, Matthew, please. And they come to this wall because it's so significant. Because this is the closest that they can legally get to say their, their Jewish or their Christian prayers. Because they're not allowed to pray on top of the Temple Mount. That's how the government is trying to keep peace over there. And so people, the closest you can get to, to the mount that was made for your temple to sit on is this wailing wall. And that's why people come to this huge, massive wall. And I've got a picture for you, Matthew. You can show them that picture now. Of just how big this is. You know, this, I hope, brings some scale to you. You can see the people and how big these stones are. This temple mount, this temple, this wall, this was built in a time, a time period where this would have been just unprecedented, unseen or unheard of anywhere else in the world. So when you think about in the Bible where it talks about Jesus approaching the city of Jerusalem, you know, that he would have seen this huge, beautiful temple mount. And in fact, this is what it would have looked like in Jesus' time. This is kind of the, the render of what it was that Solomon, who built the first temple, what, what he built. And so in all the stories and all the events that you read about in the Bible, when it talks about the temple in Jerusalem, this is what it's talking about. 
They know where it was. They know when it was built. They know who built it. They know why it's not there now. They know everything about it. And so we can assume that based on that, that the things that we read in the Bible that reference this, that they're true, they're correct. Because everything that's referenced against these locations has been checked against other sources. And so today what we're going to look at is we're going to look at uh, an event that happened. You can, hold on Matthew, go back there. Matthew is excited upstairs. We didn't have power during the last service, so he was, he, he had to wait. But Jesus, uh, what we're going to look at today is Jesus has an interaction with this place. And through Jesus' interaction with this place and the stuff that he says about it, I think it's going to inspire us to look at some things that are a bit bigger and a bit more important maybe than some of the other things that we've been thinking about in our life. Like this is eternal stuff. This is stuff that could help your eternity. But if you're in a place where, you know, you're new to church, you know, as a Christ follower, or maybe you're not even a Christ follower, this is the perfect service for you to be in. Because I'm just going to present to you stuff that we know and stuff that's been proven and tested. And then you can make a choice. Do I like that? Do I not like that? Do I want to believe it? Do I not want to believe it? Is it just going to be interesting? Or is it going to be interesting and I'm going to apply it? Or am I going to let this change my life forever? So you're going to be able to make that. My goal is to give you the info and then trust that God works and let you make that decision. But before we get into that, I need you to understand how important this temple is. And for you to understand how important it is, let me put it into some context that you can relate to. So I'll ask you this question. How do you know that you're okay. And, and if you're not okay, maybe you're in trouble. How do you go from being in trouble to being in favor? So that question, how do you know that you're okay? I'm not talking about um, how do you know that, uh, that you're okay as in are you sick or are you not sick, but specifically I'm talking about your standing or your right standing or lack of a right standing within your relationships with your spouse or your partner or your family or your boss at work, but how do you know when you walk into work on a Monday morning that you're, you're okay, you're not in trouble? How do you know when you go home and you walk in and you know, it's the end of the day that you're okay, that your spouse is okay, that, that no one's in trouble and everybody is fine? You know, there, there, there's certain cues that we can pick up on, but in general, we have these systems that are put in place in our lives. These are basically behavior management systems. And a behavior management system is there to help you know whether or not you're okay or you're not okay. Are you living your life the right way? Or are you living your life the wrong way? So, for, for example, the city here, you went through many behavior management systems on your way here this morning. Every robot that you stopped at is a behavior management system. If you obey the, the rules of the road, then when it turns red, you stop at red. You know you're okay because you don't have a ticket. You know that you're not okay if, I mean, the city of Cape Town has shown recently they will impound a vehicle if it doesn't obey the behavior management system that we follow here in this city. So another behavior management system that's just baked into our lives every day is your alarm clock. You've got to set alarm clocks. It wakes you up in the morning. You know that you've got to get up. You've got to go to work. Your work has rules. Your HR department probably has a lot of rules that are there to manage the behavior in the workplace because you know that something's inappropriate or you know when something is, is appropriate and okay to do. I mean, even Leifa, uh, my 15-year-old, I can't believe he's 15, he's at school at Ronnebosch, and they make all the boys line up in a line. Any old, old boys, Ronnebosch old boys in the room? Yeah, we, got a, we got a couple here. They make them all line up in a line, and they go through, and they do a hair check on all of them. And they just go through and check every person's hair, and then if their hair's not doesn't meet the requirements, they pick them out, and they have a couple days to get it sorted before they you know, uh, get in trouble for not having their hair in order. So there's behavior management systems even in our school system. The way your family operates, you've got certain rules in your house that let people know that you're okay, or let people know that they're not okay. So what I want you to understand is this, is that in your life, there are systems in place, whether you know them or not, that let you feel or let you know whether you're doing okay or you're not doing okay. There are things in your life that tell you, are you in trouble 
or you're not in trouble. Some of you have very loud things in your life that tell you that you're in trouble, and you wish that they were a little bit quieter. But then some of you are always kind of wondering, am I in trouble? Am I not in trouble? That's just a hard place to live. It's a hard kind of relationship to be in. Now, the Temple Mount also was a behavior management system. And the Temple Mount played a really critical role in helping people to understand whether or not they were okay with God or whether they were not okay with God. They didn't have a lot of other systems in place, especially the Jewish people. It really came down to the law, the law that Moses gave them, and then that was kind of presented to them through what happened at the temple, on top of the Temple Mount. So that's where we're going to pick up a story here where we jump into Jesus and his disciples. So remember the picture of the temple, this huge thing up on the hill there. One day, Jesus and his disciples, they leave that place. And we pick up here in Mark chapter, uh, chapter, Mark 13, verse 1 says this. So as he was coming out of the temple, this is Jesus coming out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, teacher, because Jesus was a rabbi, which means that he was their teacher at the time says, teacher, look what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings all of these are. And they were just marveling in the engineering of, uh, of the temple wall that they were walking by. In fact, look at how big these stones are. I've got a guy, I'm not related to this guy, I don't know him. I took his picture from the internet. But this does a beautiful job of just showing just how huge these stones were, how impressive it was that this thing was built, you know, they didn't have cranes, they didn't have uh, diesel generators and, and all this other stuff that we have today that we build with. I don't know how they did this, but they did it. They cut all these stones from a quarry, transported them, and then set them on top of each other to build the Temple Mount. So Jesus and his disciples are walking by. And just like this guy, they're saying, wow, look how amazing this thing is. It's absolutely spectacular. And Jesus responds in the next verse, in verse 2. And he says, okay, you see these great buildings that we're walking through here? Not one stone will be left on another which will not be torn down. So what Jesus is telling them is that this temple is going to literally be torn down. So not only are the stones going to be torn down, but that means the temple will be torn down. And if the temple is torn down, then guess what else is torn down? Their behavior management system. See, without the temple, there's no way for them to know if they're in right standing with God or not. The only way that you know that you're okay with God, if you're in, in 30 AD, if you're in this time period, the only way that you know that you and God are okay is because you can go to the temple and you can put forth a sacrifice for your sins, for your family's sins. And when you do that, you know that you are now in right standing with God. So when Jesus says, I'm going to tear down the temple, Jesus is also saying that you're also going to lose your entire way that you would reach any kind of atonement for your sin. It's all going to be gone. This is a, a big statement. It's, it's a heavy statement for Jesus to say, and it's quite unbelievable for people to even believe in. In fact, Jesus says it again in John. He, he tells the same thing to the disciples and to others and not only does John record what Jesus said, John's going to give us a bit of a behind-the-scenes look at what Jesus was talking about. So Jesus, he answers the, the disciples, and he says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then verse 20, the Jews replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? That, that's unbelievable. That doesn't make any sense. So the, people couldn't understand because see, we know the end of the Bible. And if you're in here, then there's a good chance that you've grown up around church long enough that you know, okay, we, we say that Jesus died. He rose from the grave. That, that he's our Savior. You know, he died for our sins. So when we read things like Jesus is going to tear down the temple and then rebuild it in three days, it's easy for us to say, well, you know, because we know he's going to rise in three days. But, but they didn't know that. So when Jesus is telling people this, he's actually saying, or they're actually hearing him say, the temple stones will be removed from their place. They will all be tumbled down. The temple will no longer exist. 
And with that, you will no longer have any way to atone for your sins. You no longer have any way to worship God. You no longer have a place to go where you can uh, learn religious teachings, where you can participate in some kind of religious debate or conversations. You can't make any more sacrifices. Everything about everything that your entire life has been built on is going to be torn down and taken away. That's essentially, or that is exactly, what Jesus is saying. And, and I understand that people don't believe him. I understand that, that they have a hard time wrapping their head around that. I, I'm not sure that I would believe that. If I'm walking around in 30 AD, and Jesus is standing on a street corner somewhere, and I overhear him tell the disciples, like, hey, you know, this thing's going to be torn down. I'd be like, that guy is crazy, and he does not need to get into this temple. Actually, today, we'd, he'd be, like, considered a terrorist. You know? So this... Right here, this thing that Jesus is saying is unbelievable. And so, in fact, what John goes on to tell us in the next verse, he gives us insight behind this. John says in verse 21, he says, He was speaking of the temple, which was his body. So John helps us to understand, because John is retrospectively telling the story. He's saying, yes, Jesus said that he'll destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. But also, just so you know, what Jesus is talking about is his body. And see, in fact, it's not only you know, the, the common person that may struggle to believe this, but even the disciples couldn't believe this. Jesus said it two, three, four times. He told the disciples over and over again, I won't be with you forever. I'm going to tear this down. I'm going to rebuild it in three days. And they didn't get it. In fact, they didn't even believe it. In fact, it was only after Jesus' death that the disciples and, and people would come to understand that Jesus had been talking about his body. So after Jesus died, the disciples, they finally said, okay, now we understand what Jesus was saying. Now we understand what it was that he was talking about. See, one of the misnomers that we have is that the disciples just believed in Jesus all the way to the end and through the end. But I want you to hear this if you've never heard it before. When Jesus died on the cross, all the disciples stopped believing in everything that Jesus had said. All of them. They all stopped believing. They only believed again in what Jesus was saying when they saw him with their eyes, when they saw and felt the holes in his hands and his feet. But up until then, they, they didn't know, they didn't believe anything that Jesus had taught, because he was dead. He was gone. Jesus wasn't supposed to die. He was supposed to be their Savior. But now he's dead and he's gone. So this concept that Jesus would be the temple, that he would rebuild this, this temple after it was destroyed in three days, it's a hard concept for people to understand back then. It's a hard concept for us to understand it now. But before I go on to tell you more about that because we're going to get into two stories. One is a story about John the Baptist and one is a story that comes from Paul as Paul's writing one of his letters to the church in Corinth. But before that, I need to make sure that you understand the significance of this. Your temple, the, the temple that was there for the Jewish people was their only source of God. And it was their only source of a God. And it was the only way that they knew that they were okay with God. It was that important. It was so important that even when Jesus came, and Jesus tried to show them that he was the way, the truth, the light, all that stuff, this temple thing was so important that they crucified Jesus in order to protect the temple. They crucified Jesus and what he was saying in order to protect their religion and their ways that they knew that they were right with God. Being right with God was so important to the Jewish people that they crucified God's Son, not knowing that He was God's Son, but crucified Him so that what they knew to be true between their relationship with you know, them and God could not be hurt or couldn't be damaged. The Pharisees knew they needed the temple that kept them in power over the people. The people knew that they needed the temple because it was their way of coming and making sacrifices and getting forgiveness for their sins and making sure their family was in right standing. That's how important that this thing was. And now Jesus walks down the road and he says casually, I'm going to tear this down. This thing's going to be torn down. 
Not one single stone will sit on another stone. And so now I want to kind of tell you, there's a, a story about a guy named John the Baptist. John the Baptist was this sort of wild-haired guy. He ate honey and he ate locusts and he wore a uh, camel hair robe and he had a piece of leather around his belt. And he's sitting in the river. And inside the river here, he's outside of town. Inside the river where he's sitting, he's baptizing people. They don't know baptism like we know baptism. He's outside of town. And he's standing there in the water, you know, waist deep in the water. And people are coming down. And he's saying, if you want to align your life with the Savior that's going to be coming. You haven't seen him yet, but he will one day come. And come down here and, give your, and get baptized. Publicly say that you are aligning with this guy that you've never met, that I'm screaming and shouting and telling you about. People were coming down and getting baptized. Also off to the side, there was the Pharisees, and they were acting like a bunch of good Karens over there on the side. So they're uh, just analyzing what, what John the Baptist is doing. It doesn't count if you do it that way. It's wrong if you do it that way. Why are you guys being so noisy? You're making the riverbed muddy. You know, how... Why, this doesn't count because this doesn't fit within our, our Jewish system. It doesn't fit within our behavior management system. And John is there just plucking away anyway. And there's a special moment where John the Baptist looks up from baptizing people. And he sees Jesus coming. Here's what he says in John 1.29. He says this. The next day, so he'd been baptizing people for a couple days. He saw Jesus coming to him and he said, look... The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what does this have to do with the temple? So this actually has everything to do with the temple. To what, what happened at the temple? Let's take Passover, for example. Passover is a big celebration. It's one of the few Jewish holidays. And everyone in all of the land would come to the temple for Passover. And when you came for Passover, you brought with you a lamb. And with that lamb, you took it up to the temple, and the high priest would take your lamb, and he would sacrifice and kill that lamb. And when the lamb was sacrificed and killed, he would give you the lamb back, and you would take it home, and you would eat it. And that sacrificial lamb would atone for the sins of you and your family, your entire household. That's the way that sacrifice worked. Now, the reason this has everything to do with the temple is because John the Baptist says, Look, the Lamb, everyone say Lamb, Lamb, the Lamb of God is coming. See, Jesus says the temple will be torn down. So if you tear the temple down, you tear down the way that people would sacrifice and make atonement for their sin. John the Baptist is saying Jesus is actually the Lamb, meaning you don't need the temple. Jesus is going to be your temple. Jesus will be the Lamb which means he will be sacrificed so that our sins can be atoned for and forgiven. So what happens to Jesus? The exact same thing that happens to a lamb. Guess who took Jesus to be sacrificed? Who, who sentenced him to the cross? The high priest. The same person that takes the sacrificial lamb for you and your family and offers it to God. The high priest takes Jesus and offers him to Pilate and the Romans to be sacrificed, to be crucified. John the Baptist doesn't know any of this is going to happen. But what John knows is that this man that's walking up to him now, this man is the Lamb of God. He's the last sacrifice that will ever need to be made. He's the one that will take away all the sins of the world. See, this has everything to do with the temple. Because Jesus says that he is going to raise up in three days. He's going to be the temple. He's going to be that for us. Now, we can also look at a story. This is Paul that we're going to look at now. Paul is writing a letter to the Gentiles, and he's talking about what Jesus did for them. Paul's also reinforcing this same concept, that you don't need the temple because now you have Jesus. And so Paul's talking to a church that he started, the church in Corinth, and he wants them to understand what Jesus did for them. Think about a legalistic society that's still battling against remnants of old culture and old ways of doing stuff. And Paul's trying to help them so that they don't get caught up in all of that stuff. So that they know that there's freedom in Christ. And this is what he tells them. This is how he would explain this to a, a new church. A church largely of maybe unbelievers. And Paul says this in verse 21. 
He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our, our behalf. So he's saying God above made Christ. Christ is the Son of God. God made Christ. Christ had no sin. Christ came to earth. He became the sin for us. He became sin on our behalf. So that in Him, so because we believe in God, we would become the righteousness of God. That is, that we would be made acceptable to Him and placed in right relationship with Him by His gracious, loving kindness. See, there's that placed in right relationship. How do we know that we're okay with God? It's not the temple. See, Paul is telling people, Christ, He was without sin. You are sinful. Christ is is not sinful. God is not sinful. You're sinful. You're dirty, sinful people. When you die, you cannot be in relationship with God. God's perfect. God can't let sin enter into His kingdom. If you're sinful, you can't go to heaven. You can't be with God. So that's a big problem. But instead, God gives us this very elegant solution. Jesus will be your sin for you. Jesus will wipe it out. He'll take care of all of it. Well, that's very nice of Jesus to do. How does that happen? Well, that happens because Jesus takes on the price of your sin. He becomes the final sacrifice here. So Paul's trying to explain this thing to this church and say that you're forgiven of your sins. You just have to accept that forgiveness. So now that we know those two things, we can go back to that moment in Mark, where Mark and where Jesus and the disciples are walking next to the temple here. So we know that as Jesus is now walking this road, we know a couple things now. We know that when Jesus is talking about how the temple will be torn down brick by brick, and that it'll be rebuilt in three days, we know Jesus is talking about his body. And we know that it's important that he's talking about his body because that means that he's the final sacrifice for all of us. John the Baptist put it so well. And everyone that grew up in this time would understand the connection. As soon as John said, the Lamb of God, everyone would have known, Lamb, sacrifice. Ah, he's the one that goes up to the altar on my behalf. So now that we know all of those things, let's look back at this here. In Mark 13, verse 1. The disciples and Jesus are coming out of the temple. And as they're coming out of the temple grounds, one of the disciples looks at them and says, Teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Just marveling in this temple that's around here. So Jesus, now he gives them bad news. He gives them good news. So the bad news that Jesus gives is the temple is going to be destroyed and their behavior modification, behavior management system is going to be no more. Well, the good news that Jesus gives is that Jesus is replacing the temple. Jesus will take place of that. So, brings me back to the first, one of the first questions I asked you today. How do you know, or how do I know, that I'm okay with Jesus? How do I know that I'm okay with God? This was the whole point of the temple, was that I could answer this question if I knew about the temple, if I could go to the temple. Now, today, we don't have a temple. Today, we have to answer this question ourselves. We, we wake up in the morning, we go to bed at night, we lay awake in the night, and we wonder, am I okay with God? Is there a God to even be okay with? Well, I want to give you something that you can put your faith in and something that I can prove to you and hopefully lead you down a, a thought pathway that there is a way for you to know whether or not you're okay with God. See, in 30 AD, Jesus makes this prediction to us. It's the year 30 AD, Jesus and his disciples are walking alongside the temple, and he says, the temple will be torn down stone by stone by stone. Not one single stone will be left on top of another stone. Then in 60 AD, the Jewish king at the time, King Herod, he would revolt against the Roman Empire. And when he revolted against the Roman Empire, the Romans, they decided, we're going to squash this thing. We're not going to let the Jewish religion, the Jewish people grow and and gain momentum and steam here. And so the Roman Empire started at the top, and they just started knocking out town after town after town, village after village, just conquering the entire way down. And then eventually, around 70 A.D., they knocked on the door of Jerusalem, And in 70 AD, the Roman Empire came in 
and they wiped out and they destroyed Jerusalem. So now you have, kind of like Jesus said, the temple torn down. But again, how is it we know that this is not a fairy tale? Jesus said two things. He said, the temple will be torn down stone by stone by stone. And then he said that I will replace the temple. I will be the sacrificial lamb for you for all of eternity. So if I can prove to you one of those two things, then hopefully you can believe the other one. And this is the point where I want you to take that rock that you've got in your hand. Everyone was given a a rock as they came in here. Now I want you to look here on the screen. On the screen here is a pile of rocks. This pile of rocks, these are the actual rocks that made up the temple wall. And in the 90s, they did an excavation around the temple. And they dug and they dug and they dug. And as they were digging, about three, four, five meters down, they found this pile of rocks and it went all the way around the temple wall. And what this pile of rocks was dated to, what it was confirmed that it is, is that it was the original temple wall. So just as Jesus spoke about the Roman Empire, when they came in and they toppled Jerusalem, they also toppled the wall. Not one single stone was left built on top of the other stone. See, this stone that you have in your seat, that you have in your hand with you now, this is a, it's a confirmation of these stones that sit here. What this is, is this is a confirmation that Jesus said that the temple would be torn down so that you could then also believe in the second part of what Jesus said. See, what Jesus has done is he's traded fallen stones for a risen king. See, all we have to do, you don't have to believe everything there is to believe about Jesus to make this decision for your life. All you have to do is look at history, look at proven history. You can see this man predicted that something would happen. What's harder for someone to predict? That they will be the savior of the universe? And, and how do they prove that? Or, or what's, what's harder to predict? I think it's harder to predict that a wall made of stones the size of people is going to be completely torn down. See, I can say anything I want to about myself. It's hard to prove that. But I can very easily prove what Jesus said about the temple walls by showing you that picture. And by giving you a rock that's in your hand to remind you of that. So what I hope that this does, I hope it inspires you to put a little bit of faith into a risen king. That because of fallen stones, we have a risen king. And so I'm going to lead us in two prayers this morning. And one of these prayers is going to be for those of you that you've given your life to Christ. You are a Christ follower. But maybe as you hold this stone in your hand, you're just inspired to remember God, remember Jesus and the position that he holds. Maybe you just need a reminder in your life that Jesus is your source. He's how you know that you're okay. And if you can trust that Jesus is your source, then you can also trust that Jesus was the last sacrifice that would ever have to be made for you. Meaning you can walk in freedom. For a lot of us, it's been a long time since we've walked in freedom. It's also been a long time since you reminded yourself and you lived out the fact that Jesus was your Savior. And so if that's you, I'm going to pray a prayer, and you don't have to pray it out loud. You can pray it in your heart if you're inspired to do that. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Jesus, I have struggled to believe in you lately. I have struggled to trust you lately. I have struggled to find my way with you. In fact, I have not spent a lot of time with you I've not spent a lot of time praying to you, reading my Bible, or thinking about you. Jesus, I have forgotten how good you are. I've forgotten what it feels like for for you to just have control over my life. Father, I'm afraid to give you this control. I'm afraid to turn my life over to you all the way. Father, I don't even know if you're still there for me. Father, my heart hurts, and it continues to hurt. Bad things continue to happen in my life, but are you there? And sometimes I struggle to believe, Lord, that you're there. Heavenly Father, today on this day, I'm choosing to put my faith back in you. I'm choosing to remember that you are my sacrifice, that you gave your body, you hung on the cross so that I could have complete forgiveness of sins. And if you forgive me of my sins, I'm going to choose and trust that you also love me and you love me unconditionally. So, Lord, wherever I've been, 
I don't want to stay there. I want to draw near to you. I want to believe that this fallen stone is because you are a risen king. So Lord, I put my foot down in faith and I proclaim, Jesus, you are my Lord, whether I feel it or not. You are my Savior. And I will remember that and I will walk in that this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now the last prayer that I want to pray is for those of you that don't know Jesus. Um, You've never given your life to Jesus. You don't know Him. He's not your Lord and Savior. And if that's you today, then um, this is a good opportunity for you. Like I said, you don't have to know everything that there is to know about Christ. But maybe this could inspire you a little bit to start that journey. And that journey starts with you just surrendering and accepting. You've got Jesus who wants to be the final sacrifice for you. Meaning your sins are gone. They're done. You can walk in freedom for the rest of your life. Nothing can ever take that away from you. Even if you forget it, God is always there to bring it up again and remind you over and over and over again. So if you want a little bit of that in your life, then I want you to pray this prayer with me as well. Heavenly Father, I've never given you my life. I've never given you my heart. But today, I'm inspired that I want to let you in. Lord, I want you to be my sacrifice. I want to accept the sacrifice that you were for me. Father, you are my Savior. Father, you are, are the thing that, and the only thing that I need to bring me peace, bring me joy, to forgive me of my sins. So Lord, I don't understand it all. But I know in this moment, because of fallen stones, I choose to believe in you as a risen King. And I ask you to come into my life, come into my heart, and save me forever. In Jesus' name we pray.